um, recorded. If someone would like to speak to an agenda item, they must complete a speaker card and submit the speaker card to Ms. Alicia Jimenez prior to the agenda. And once an item has been done, the card will not be accepted for that item. Each speaker will have two minutes with the total time for public input on each agenda item to a maximum of 30 minutes. I also want to remind everyone of adoption of the Governing Board of Education of PBDC's established adopted meeting norms from the last board meeting. And also like to take a moment to remind everyone that we do have a student trustee who is sitting up with him, here with us as well. And we'll now move us to 3.2, the Pledge of Allegiance. And I will ask Trustee Vice President Oscar Soto to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Sorry about that. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I would like to spend my time tonight just thanking the entire community of PBUSD, from our employees to our students to our families uh, to our community partners. Our attendance campaign has demonstrated some incredibly promising data. We have our attendance up far above where we were last year at the same time, and we are also outperforming uh, many other districts and their results with attendance at this time. We're very proud of that, uh, and it's really a huge gratitude to the entire community. It's a definite um, point out to when we work together as a team, we get results, and that is what's happening with our attendance. So thank you to everyone. I'm really excited about that. I also want to draw attention that 
up here on the dais, we have all these cute little hands and it's students who are giving comments about how much they like after school. We just are recently celebrating our after school programs um, and this is an example of the great things that, that students do. And on each of these hands, and there's I think about 20 or more of them up here, um, are, we have comments about what they love about after school. One of them even says, I like math. Mr. Beecher, I think that was just for you right there. <laughs> Thank you. And on this item, um, we are also now going to turn this over to uh, Trustee DeSerpa and our newly appointed Trustee Dr. Navarro. And Trustee DeSerpa will swear in Trustee Dr. Navarro. Dr. Navarro, sorry about that everybody. Dr. Navarro, we're so grateful that you um, want to be and join on the board. So thank you for being here tonight. So if you would repeat after me. I, Misty Navarro, do solemnly swear. I, Misty Navarro, do solemnly swear. I, Misty Navarro, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. And that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. For purpose of evasion. For purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Thank you. superintendent to be intentional about change making I would hope the same for you and I feel like um, one of the changes that I hope you and maybe you know any other new trustee bring is um, like a reaffirmed commitment to that Constitution because I honestly worry about it sometimes um, in our larger national picture politics but then also here when I when I hear these some of these um, the trends here I want you to know that it's not normal what's been happening and that we never used to have these these limits and that I feel like it it weakens us and that we one of the things I liked about your comments was you said you wanted to hear from the community you said um, you cared about equal opportunity so those were the things that stuck out to me um, and I hope you'll you'll live up to those things and don't let other people make you on this board make you think that like the right role for you or any trustee is to get in some kind of like antagonistic relationship with the community like that th those people they don't really belong here um, it's shocking to me that they would even carry on the way they have been in an election year and, and it's it, I worry about that like I worry the how they will act um, I kind of think that the entire board uh, like you know there's kind of a perception that 
um, it's all the community, the ruckus or whatever. But like, like I said previously, you guys kind of brought this on on yourself, and it didn't have to be this way. So I would hope that everybody makes a, a earnest effort to make things better. And also, Trustee Flores, I want to also thank you for your comments at that special board meeting. I think you showed some real leadership there, um, being the first one to really make a, a actual move. Thank you. Superintendent's Interim Committee meeting, various schools elaborating upon their current and upcoming events. Aptos High began planning its Five Star Fest, a prize redemption event for students who have accumulated points for displaying praiseworthy behaviors. This week is College and Career Week at Aptos High, which includes university rep visits throughout the week, such as Princeton University. And in, in addition to these College and Career Weeks, Aptos High celebrated its Club, club Carnival today with over 38 clubs selling goods and gathering funds for their clubs. The ongoing gas pipeline construction has become difficult, especially with certain areas of the school being closed off, resulting in traffic during the passing periods. Walton High kicked off the week by selling boot grams in preparation for their upcoming Halloween Spirit Week next week. A lot of decoration has taken place throughout campus, as well as their senior nights during sporting events. The bleacher renovation has impacted the ability to host games on campus, resulting in games being hosted at Cabrillo. New School joined our committee for the first time and reported on fun field trips that make that take place each Thursday in the volleyball championships that will be held this Friday. PCCS also joined our committee for the first time and elaborated on the loss of teachers, which has resulted in the absence of events and field trips. Pottero Valley High is also hosting its college and career week. Students are prepping for the football game next Saturday, which is their senior night, and all seniors will be walking as well as the Valley Flotico group from for Dia de los Muertos. Club Carnival will be held next week as well as Halloween, as well as a Halloween costume contest. Students would like to see an improvement in soap dispensers as the vast majority of them are often empty. On another note, I would like to address discussions that I have had among fellow students regarding comments that have been made on this board. During the board meeting on September 25th, Vice President Soto stated that this is just a clear demonstration of the ignorance in the community. Vice President Soto, students within our community are deeply hurt by your words. According to the Governing Board Handbook's core values, specifically with empathy, we foster a culture of understanding and compassion, recognizing the diverse experiences and perspectives of our community and supporting each other with kindness and respect. President Acosta, I believe that along with the public, we should also hold ourselves accountable to model those qualities. Thank you. Trustee Bolano Scow. Uh, good evening, everybody, and to everybody watching, greeting live from the Mellow Center. Uh, this is a big room, and we've got a good turnout, and I just want to thank uh, student trustee for another good report about what's happening at the high schools. I find those very important and informative. I wanted to let everybody know we're going to have, many of our students will be performing at the Dia de los Muertos event sponsored by the Watsonville Film Festival, which is Friday, November 1st, I believe it is. Uh, I think the performances start around 5 o'clock, maybe even earlier, 4 o'clock. The Watsonville Plaza is going to be uh, some student groups, orchestras, uh, orchestra, mariachi, it's going to be a lot of great things happening. It's a great, great day in Watsonville. Um, I also want to welcome our new trustee, Dr. Navarro, our board. Uh, very impressive uh, interview, and I know your background is also uh, very much rooted in our community and serving people, so I think you're going to be a great addition, and I just want to welcome you. Thank you. Sir, Great honor tonight. Colleague, a wonderful doctor in the emergency department, and I know she'll do a great job here on the board. So, welcome and thank you for stepping forward um, for this very important position. I attended the um, community advisory council today for uh, the adult school 
and was very impressed by Dr. Bilicic's presentation. So thank you, Dr. Bilicic. It was great. And um, that, that's it for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeServa. Trustee Dr. Navarro. I just wanted to say a quick thank you to Trustee DeServa for encouraging me. Um, we've known each other for a long time at work. Um, I've always been impressed with the work that she's done, and we have mutual respect and understanding for one another. Um, I realize that this is a very different experience than what I've done at the hospital, but I'm surprised every day at all the overlap between the two. Uh, I look forward to this challenge, and I hope that I can impress you and do a good job with it. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Navarro. Trustee Flores. Okay, I just want to apologize for the sunglasses. Um, I do have an ocular migraine, and these lights are not helping. So I apologize. I am going to do my best to hang in as long as I can tonight. Um, but just that's all I'm going to say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Trustee Vice President Santo. All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. I just want to extend a great welcome to Dr. Navarro for putting her name in the hat and being selected for this position. And I can tell them just when the, over the last hour that you're going to make a big difference out here. I got a good feeling about you. Um, I want to thank the Freedom Rotary for putting on the Uncork Coralios this weekend. Uh, it was a fundraiser. Uh, that funded Papua Middle School's mental health program. So I want to make a, uh, extend a big thank you to them. I also want to thank CSCA, your great organization, and I uh, appreciate you. Mr. Skeda, you want to be part of this board, correct? You want to be a member, a colleague? That comment that I made was directed at the very person you endorsed. That person has no, how should I put it, knowledge and experience of civics. So that comment that I made was directed at him based on an outburst from the audience. So I think you should get your facts straight and get your information correct before making any type of accusation. Thank you. of you in applying, and I would agree with the sentiment that Trustee Soto made um, in working with you for the past hour plus. Um, I'm very excited and hopeful for this board and this district with you in that seat and role. Um, and then the only other comment I want to make right now at this time is to um, acknowledge that Trustee uh, Dodge Jr. does have an excused absence from this evening's meeting. We will now move to item 3.5, our Red Apple Award, and this will be presented by our PIO. Ms. Alicia Jimenez will present our Red Apple Award recipients. Are you awake now? <laughs> so welcome, thank you for being with us today here at the Mellow Center. And thank you Watsonville High School for hosting us. Go Wildcats. I have the honor of welcoming and introducing the Red Apple Award winners, where peers select an administrator, a certificated and a classified staff to be acknowledged by the board 
and that staff members acknowledged embodying one of the core values that represent the board and the school district. So first, I'm going to be inviting Wendy Gomez. Is Wendy Gomez here? Yes, she is. Come on up. <laughs> Wendy Gomez is an instructional assistant here at Watsonville High School, so she knows how to get here very well. Uh, Wendy is an amazing instructional assistant, always going above and beyond to help students and staff. And they said that Wendy embodies resilience. Thank you for being here, Wendy. I'd like to acknowledge Matt McGinty. Is Mr. McGinty here? Yes. Excellent. Mr. McGinty is a teacher at Lakeview Middle School. He is an incredible teacher and demonstrates excellence. Mr. McGinty teaches seventh grade in English language, arts, and social studies, but he does not just teach. He engages students to care and think deeply within grade level curriculum and standards. Additionally, he has brought with much thanks to PVUSD's curriculum and instruction department, AI, to the classroom. Mr. McGinty's students used an AI bot to ask questions to Julius Sisson, and they created AI art that reflected poems that they wrote. Mr. McGinty prepares our students for a future of learning, and he embodies excellent. Thank you. excellence. Thank you, Mr. McGinty. sensitively to difficulties, kindness, and unwavering positivity. He swiftly addresses my issues and cons consistently shows gentleness towards our students. This award is well-deserved recognition for his outstanding qualities. And they will acknowledge Mr. Westfall for embodying grace. Thank you. Continue doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jimenez, for that. Um, now we will move us to item four, the approval agenda, item 4.1. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make a motion. I have a first from the server and a second thing from staff. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Thank you. Um, I will now move us to item five, the approval of minutes. Uh, 5.1 approval of the October 9th, 2024 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion to approve? Thank you, Trustee Scout, Vice President Scout. I have a first. Can I have a second? I mean, Trustee, excuse me, Trustee Vice President Soto. Pardon me. 
I have a first from Trustee Vice President Soto. Can I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Let's see if I get your name to it tonight. I have a first and a second. Can I have all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 701. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. That will carry 601. And then I will now move us to item 6, action and report on closed session item. Are there any um, items to report from closed session? Yeah, so from board meeting, uh, January 23, 24, we have motion number one, closed session item 2.1. I move to approve certificate personnel report as presented by district administration on, on October 23rd, 2024, with 10 and one additional action items. I second. I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry seven. Zero. Motion number two, closed session item 2.2. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on October 23rd with 15 and seven additional action items. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? One, this is an offer. This is for public comment. This is the opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please know that the Brown Act prohibits us from the board from engaging in discussion for non agendized items. Do we have any public comments? Yes, we do, Ms. Brooker, Ross Schornstein. Lauren Left, Bill Beecher, Chris Webb, and Maya Mendoza. Sorry about that, Bill. Riley. Alan Sook, is that correct? It's me, I'm back again, everyone, and I just wanted to remind uh, the community, and I'm very grateful uh, for this opportunity to talk about the Ruby Bridges um, walk to school event uh, that PB High School has invited the whole community to participate in. Um, as I mentioned before, schools all across the nation are participating in this national event to remember a brave woman who at six years old uh, was escorted to school by federal marshals. Um, she has a quote, kids know nothing about racism, they're taught that by adults. And so I did have merchandise here before, I believe I gave it to Miss Peggy Pugh. Yes, I did, and I hope she gave some of the beanies and some of the uh, wristlets and some of the hats I also have this banner, and what I'm hoping is, Dr. Contreras, after we finish our walk this year, I would love for you to have this banner in your office, because if everything works out okay, I'm hoping to get new merchandise every single year, because I'm hoping that this district will continue to participate in such a worthy cause every single year. We have this saying, well, what's good? What's good at PB High? I hope when the community thinks about this national event, the walk to school, I hope people can look at that and say, hey, that's one thing. Well, there's many things good at PB High, forgive me. But this is definitely one thing worth talking about. And so community, you're welcome to come. November 14th, we're trying to make some logistical um, 
activities as far as how we're going to walk and how everyone is going to participate. And I want to give a special thank, thank you to Alicia Jimenez, this lady right here, who has helped me with the presentation. Everyone will get a chance to see it. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Roz Shorenstein. I'm here to submit four documents for the public records of tonight's meeting in support of ethnic studies without CRE. First is a letter from four rabbis representing several Jewish congregations in Paro Valley and Santa Cruz County. The rabbis favor, quote, a curriculum that will unite, not divide, the PVUSD community and celebrate our diversity, not exploit it for political ends, end quote. Second, Rabbi Cooper of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, a leader in the fight against anti-Semitism, says the board's decision not to renew the CRE contract was, quote, the right and courageous decision, end quote. Third, the Camera Education Institute considers that the board, quote, made the correct decision not to allocate anti-bias grant funding to CRE, end quote. Fourth, I have included the Screening Out Hate, an anti-Semitism checklist for K through 12 communities developed by the National Education Association. I hope that the board will consider adopting this checklist as a useful tool for administrators and teachers going forward. Thank you so much for your service to the entire PBSD community. Studies. The state's model ethnic studies curriculum is free and extensive and well vetted, which is why Scotts Valley is currently using it and Santa Cruz City will be using it next year. It is so exhaustive and extensive, teachers can glean so much information from it. I took a look at lesson one, which is called Migration Stories and Oral History. The students will learn about their own family's migration. They will conduct oral history interviews and they will learn from each other by being exposed to unique stories. And then there are all these links for extra research and here's just a quick sampling of what's embedded in this. Famous African American women in STEM, the disturbing history of African Americans and medical research, the birth of jazz, Brown versus the Board of Ed, DACA, the 1924 Immigration Act, and American Exclusion. Why tens of thousands of kids from El Salvador continue to flee to the U.S. Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. East L.A. 1968 walkout, the day high school students helped ignite the Chicano movement. U.S. deports dozens more Cam Cambodian immigrants, some for decades old crimes. 150 years ago, Chinese railroad workers staged the era's largest labor strike. The Chinese experience in the 19th century. Minidoka, an American concentration camp. Japanese American internment memories. Korean Americans are facing and dealing with the racial divide hate crimes during the Persian Gulf War, PBS Asian American Collection, Southeast Asian Refugees, and Indigenous People's History of the U.S., Map of Native Lands, Anti-Defamation and Mascots, Has Anti-Semitism Returned with a Vengeance? Are Jews, and it goes on and on, but thank you for asking. Good evening. Um, well, I just want to say, as somebody who had the CRE training that, that initial year, um, the curriculum was never really divided in the community. That was, that was the work of a couple um, relatively unknown voices in this community, and um, they're the people they made con campaign contributions to. It wasn't the curriculum. In fact, some of the things that I heard in that curriculum there 
are things I had heard also in the CRE curriculum. So am I supposed to reject them now that I've heard them approved by some special interest? The CRE curriculum was vetted by the teachers. It was vetted by the old soup, the district leadership. Uh, this very board approved it twice. So I actually, about that, I felt like it was actually really messed up the way uh, the people who suddenly decided to turn on their own district leadership attacked Claudia that evening for saying she didn't vet it after you guys had already approved it twice. Um, I thought that was really messed up. Also, um, I want to apologize to Trustee Esqueda um, on behalf of the community. Um, I want you to know that um, you're already a part of this board. You're a very important part of this board. You've been killing it every meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership. Do not be dissuaded. This guy might not even be here come January. Yeah. I hope he's not. I, I can't hope. If, you, if you care about having a stable district and doing the right thing, then I, I feel like there's two people that, that you need to go. And it's been clearly like their most unstable moments have been um, with, with you. I feel like you're not a bad trustee, Acosta, but when you're in the power position, it's been very troublesome and disconcerting. And it seems like there's just no, no reasoning. But I do want to think I did hear you helped out one of uh, the, my members here at, at Watsonville High. I appreciate that. Um, I just wish it was more generally like that. Also, I want to thank Dr. Barajas for the last meeting. She also showed leadership. She was willing to apologize, and she was attacked in a weird way. Didn't even need the apology, but she did it anyway. Thank you. I'm an undergraduate student at UC Santa Cruz, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the communities of students and families within the Parma Valley Unified School District who deserve to have access to ethnic studies, more specifically community responsive education and the fields curriculum that was created by Dr. Allison Tinti Banco Cubales. As someone who's been able to witness the students rallying together in support of ethnic studies, it was so eye-opening to hear especially other Filipino-American students speak to Dr. Allison Tintiago Cubales themselves and thank her for allowing them to finally be proud of their Filipino heritage. To be proud to call themselves a Filipino because before that they never had access to the very rich Filipino-American history in Pajaro Valley, especially that history here in Watsonville which is why I'm here today um, urging you to please put the CRE contract back into motion so that children are lo no longer taught to internalize hatred towards their ethnic heritage. Thank you. Hi, um, it's nice to see everyone out here, seeing community come together um, and advocate for the youth. I'm also a community member here to just advocate for the youth. Um, I'm part of this growing group to bring back quality ethnic studies and bring back the CRE contract here in our community. I'm disappointed to see a continued failure from legislators, trustees, council members, whatever you want to call yourselves, in this community to not listen or respect the needs of their constituents, um, favoring some voices over others, which very much shows your own biases and shortcomings. Um, bring back CRE. I also haven't seen any hard evidence on how SROs are actually benefiting campuses or students. Um, I probably would say that that evidence doesn't actually exist. I don't think SROs bring um, access to basic needs or mentor students or lower violence or truancy or build the meaningful relationships that our communities need. Um, and yeah, I'm so sorry for that flagrant display of insecurity and male aggression. You do not deserve that. Um, but yeah, I'm just here to second some voices and really urge um, the school board to listen and respect the community. Thank you. Yeah. Alright, so we have a card here for DJ Williams or Andres Ortiz. Who might be speaking? DJ. Alright, Christina Hong. Omar Diekis, 
You know, Brian, Bobby Peltz, and I think we'll have to get that off. Hello, hello. <clears throat> My name is DJ Williams. I'm here. <coughs> Here representing the Santa Cruz County of Education, here with my partner, Carmen Suvar, Andres Ortiz. And uh, we're here to talk about Ruby Bridges' uh, Walk to School Day, November 14th. And just to remind everybody that Ruby's story reminds us that everyone deserves a chance to learn and be treated fairly no matter who they are. And so we just encourage everyone to come participate November 14th. Um, we are happy to say that Soquel High School and Santa Cruz High School as well will be participating this year. It's because of Ms. Berger, so we're really happy to encourage more people to participate and for everyone to come and support. We also hope to expand next year and bring Watsonville High to uh, participate as well, so thank you all. Trustee Soto, you said to Trustee Esqueda, Get your facts straight. Not only is that reprehensible, your bullying is so reprehensible, yep. and you are not fit to actually sit on this board if you're going to treat a student that way yep. publicly, but you need to get your facts straight. And so in an article, in an interview with Hillary Ojeda of Lookout um, newspaper, you stated that one of the, re the reason why you were not bringing back the CRE contract is that AB 2918 was in play. Get your facts straight. It didn't even advance. Okay, so you are saying that a bill that didn't even advance because, actually, did you know that the largest teachers union in the state, the CTA, opposed that? That was an anti-ethnic studies bill that was put forward by the Legislative Jewish Caucus. What you are doing right now is you're doing this community a disservice. You have weaponized false charges of anti-Semitism. And more than that, you're actually suggesting that the classroom is not a place to discuss the pressing crises of the day. There is a genocide happening in Palestine. And you are not open to the classroom being a place to learn the deep history of that area, to learn the history of people's struggles, and to actually sit with uncomfortable truths. That is our job as educators. I think you owe Trustee Esqueda an apology. USD parent. My daughter attends Mar Vista Elementary. We've had a really good year at Mar Vista so far. We have a really tight-knit parent community. We have Ronnie Platt and Katie Spicer who love our school and they work really hard for us. Um, but to be quite honest, there is um, some talk with our parent community about our deep concerns sending our children to Aptos Junior High. Our children are for the most part in second and third grade and this goes all throughout the grade levels with these concerns. Unfortunately, North District and PVUSD is known to be um, a district that does not, does not, uh, has a reputation of allowing problematic behavior. And what I've noticed um, is that we have two very large pendulum swings of what the district decides and the board decides, it's either punitive or restorative, and we're not meeting in the middle. We need to have some kind of consequence for consistent, consistent problematic behavior while still giving the restorative peace. Our teachers and our students and our parents can't keep swinging from one end to the other. It makes it really difficult to know what is appropriate in the school and what is not. We also have had a lot of um, administrative turnover and not just at Aptos Junior throughout our middle schools. Our students and our teachers can never find a calibration if we keep moving our administration. 
And unfortunately, it gets in the way of us creating a culture and a connection that we need desperately at our schools. So I, I do want to say I feel like it is telling um, of how the district teach our, treats our administrators and how the board treats our administrators and the fact that we have had such large turnover. And I do want to state that um, this idea that we allow problematic behavior, that we just say, hey, go ahead and talk about it and go back to class, is why we are losing kids in Aptos to SoCal and private schools. Thank you. Uh, Bob McCrell, Boston High. Uh, I'm here to speak on the CRE contract. Turkey Soto, at a board meeting two weeks ago, I watched as he made an unnecessary display in pointing out that the school board doesn't have jurisdiction over the sidewalks in our community. Instead of using that as an opportunity to show understanding and compassion for folks who rightly deserve sidewalks, you went out of your way to point out that sidewalks are not your responsibility. Turkey Soto, it's not about the sidewalks. People know you can't do that. It's about making people feel like it matters. When I gave my first speech, it was prompt to the cancellation of the CRE contract and shared with all of you that I felt frustrated and unheard. I invited you to my classroom and asked for open dialogue. Can't help but wonder how things might have turned out differently if one of you had taken me up on that first offer to make me feel like I mattered. I remember asking you all to apologize to Dr. Tsukiyama Kabbalah for slandering her good name. You have no evidence of anti Semitism at the time. And you still have no evidence of anti-Semitism to this day. Can't help but wonder how things might have turned out differently if you had mustered up the courage to apologize and make Allison feel like it's a matter. And I remember proudly watching my students speak their truth for months. I marveled at the tenacity to continue speaking in the face of a board that was doing all it could to silence their voices. I will forever, forever cherish that memory. Can't help but wonder how things might have turned out differently if you had recognized the significance of their engagement, applied their efforts, and made them feel like they mattered. Trustee Soto, this isn't just about the CRE contract. It's about making people feel like they matter. It's clear to me that you don't get that. And your little display here tonight only makes that more clear to me than ever. Maybe you are doing new leadership. Support ethics studies. Bring back to our Thank you. Omaris, Barrios Unidos. I want to start off with uh, a quote. When you walk into Barrios Unidos, the first thing you see when you walk into Barrios Unidos, right when you walk in the front door, there's a quote and it says, correct each other in private, defend each other in public. And if you want to be a bully, bullies are not welcome here. He's a student. Barrios Unidos and a lot of these community members here, what they do is they empower students. What do you do? That's not empowering to your own colleague, he's a student, you know? You could have corrected him on the side, you're not in front of everybody. That's so uncalled for. Secondly, I want to uh, recognize all these students that come here. Uh, Valerie Flores, Guatemala High School, please stand up as I call your name, please. Alberto Renteria, Guatemala High School. Maria Garcia, Juan Diego, and Mark Mendoza and Daniel Asquera for the continued fight to show up to these meetings, to fight for what they believe in and something that they think that they deserve. They have been, they could be anywhere right now, they could be playing bigger than anywhere they want to be, but they choose to be here to fight for something that they believe in. It's time that you guys start listening to these students and showing them some respect. How many more times do they have to show up to these meetings? when they can be at home doing homework. How many more times do they have to go home late and get a dinner at 10 o'clock at night because they choose to be here to fight for what they believe is right? Please bring back the CRE contract and please stop being a bully. It's not welcome here. Good evening. 
uh, Madam, Madam President Acosta and all the trusted board members. Congratulations, uh, Superintendent Dr. Heather Contreras for your position. My name is Martin Guerrero, and I'm, I'm with McDonald's, your local McDonald's, and my mom, Tila Benuelos, and I are here to send you a special invitation, extend you an invitation to our 25th annual Thanksgiving breakfast on Thursday, November 28th. We serve 500, 600 uh, community members, all involved with uh, nonprofit organizations like Fuente and Wrap Around, Loaves and Fishes, Community Life Services, Pajaro Valley Shelter Services, Salvation Army, Pajaro Valley Prevention, and Student Assistance. The event has been a huge success over the last 24 years. It's a wonderful opportunity for us and dignitary volunteers to assist us. Over the years, we've asked all the city council members, the mayor, the chief of police shows up, the chief of fire shows up um, to help serve these, these clients of ours. <clears throat> we are grateful for your participation at this event and would not be possible without you. The event is family oriented, therefore we are asking for it our local nonprofits that I just mentioned, agencies to reach out and invite low-income families with children to our Thanksgiving breakfast. We will continue with our standardized McDonald's breakfast menu of hotcakes, sausage, hash browns, potatoes, orange juice, milk, and coffee. I have an invitation here. Uh, I'll pass it on to Alicia. I have one here for you also. And um, if you guys are interested, you're more than welcome. Reach out, contact us at our office. student trustee. You use your power to threaten our student trustee of his position, really? And you call yourself a trustee. A board like this makes students not want to show up to school knowing our board is against us instead of supporting us. And Soto, good job. Your comment today is going to remind people why you won't be in that seat next year. Oh, why listen to some random teenagers, you must think, Soto? Because those teenagers are the reason you get that paycheck. And these teenagers have shown that they can be better trustees than anyone on the board. Learn from the students that make it possible to get that paycheck. Where did I learn this, by the way? Ethnic studies, bring back CRE. Hi, my name's Maria, and you already know that, though. I'm here for the CRE contract, and I think it's very, I've come to let you guys know about the restrooms as well. Um, the restrooms in the quad are broken, so if you open the restrooms, they'll just stay open. They won't close. Um, unless like you slam it, and then if you try to close it, it'll just like slam. Like you can hear a big slam, and it's kind of scary when you think about it. And it's pretty bad. I don't know if you've gone in it or if you've seen them, but they're really bad if you really think about it. Because sometimes the kids don't even care, they just leave them open. But I'm just going to leave it like that because today I'm here to talk about the CRU contract. And it's been over a year. That's kind of crazy. I just, I don't, I don't see how, I see that as so crazy how this has been going on for over a year and nothing has happened. And I think Mr. Soto, I, I really, I'm really offended for what you said to him. It's not fair and like, it doesn't, why would he say that in front of everybody? It doesn't make sense. You could have said that separately. You could have said that to him like, oh, that wasn't okay. Like, you have to say it right in front of all of us. Like, I know it's not a lot of people, but it's still a quite, quite a bit of people. You didn't have to say in front of all of us. And I just think that it's crazy because I haven't gone home yet since 7 in the morning, 8 in the morning. Um, because I left, I left the school, I went to cross country practice, then I came back, then I came, I couldn't go home. Until go, at least I was able to grab food this time. I came back and then I just studied, I stayed here. So, 
I'm not going home until maybe 8.30, so that's great. And I can't walk home, I live a mile away. So that's my own thing, but I am going to be turning 18 next week, so I will vote you out, just to let you know. So good luck with that, and everybody will vote you out. So just watch out. Thank you. Hello, my name is Valeria Flores. I am a 10th grade student at Watson Bull High. Um, just as my friend Maria said, we could be anywhere right now, but we choose to be here after long school days, accompanied with the very harsh sports we participate in. Um, let's see, I'm here because I feel like I am not seen. Me and my friends really want to improve things that are happening at PBUSD, just improve our school environment in general. The lack of things to help students with being bullied with such as race, religion, disabilities, and sexuality is absolutely unacceptable. Supposedly, the school, the school staff who are hired actually care about our well-being, but from personal and friends' experiences, we have just been told to suck it up, ignore them, or even get silent treatment from teachers who choose to pick sides after only hearing one side of the story. I only have a handful of teachers that I could say deserve credit for doing their job and making us feel safe. Imagine how that has affected so many of them who have felt trapped and overwhelmed so much to the point where they are ready to end it all because they never felt supported. Another thing I want to quickly say is we need to bring back CRE. We need to continue learning about ourselves and where we come from. If you aren't in our shoes, then you shouldn't be able to be given the chance to have an opinion on what we are educated on and what we are allowed to receive. Thank you. So I do find it ironic that you're posturing on Monday night about how none of this bothers you and you go home and you kick back your feet and you laugh about and yet you can't even like get through a comment by students who are questioning the way you're acting. I think a lot of people in this room know what it's like to be on the receiving end of a man who's trying to be intimidating and I think people felt that and it was inappropriate. Anyway. How can we trust this board with $315 million in Measure M funding when you've shown that you act first and gather data afterwards and only at repeated prompting? I'm talking about how this board voted to renew the SRO contract despite no presentation, presentation on effectiveness, which had been promised. Another broken promise was to continue locking the data from various incidents, which you stopped doing a number of years ago. And finally, when you're pushed for this data, you conduct a survey that many survey respondents said was so flawed because you mix the survey responses to the SRO and the mental health clinician in one. At a recent budget meeting on an outside assessment, an outside assessor made it very clear that this district was on the path to being so without funds that a state takeover may have been very likely were it not for COVID relief funds. I want this money for our students and teachers, but the problem is in this board, which has proven itself untrustworthy and not transparent. Speaking of the SRO contract, a prior public comment said that if students don't trust law enforcement, it is the fault of the adults in their lives to instill this. I would like to remind those listening that four years ago, we all saw police murder George Floyd. For some students, feeling uncomfortable or unsafe around law enforcement is grounded in reality, and we must honor that. Finally, there was an exhaustive list about what is in the California guidelines that are free for ethnic studies. And I've looked at that too, and I've run the search function. And uh, for everything that they listed, there is nothing about Palestine. And that's important. Hello, I'm Dan with Kendall and Camps. Appreciate you squeezing me in. I'm here with some good news and a hearty thank you. Um, Kenlin was allowed to participate in the extended learning program for the past four July summer camps this summer. And PBUSD serves several hundred kids in this program. It's, it's truly amazing and PBUSD is one of the few districts in the state that actually takes this money and helps send kids to enrichment programs. So we're grateful for that. We thought Ms. Zuniga, Ms. Bruno, and their team did a great job making the process go smoothly. We had uh, 63 kids at our three different camps. One of them is here, Julian, with his mom, Veronica. 
Sorry, we were late. We wound up at, uh, uh, where was it, at 275 Main Street. I thought the meeting was over there. Um, but the, out, the outpour of thanks from the families that attended was truly amazing. Um, my grandparents started the camp in 1946. I'm the day camp director. I was formerly a teacher here, so it's been about 20 years since uh, I've been in the Mellow Center, back when I was chaperoning a, a drama production. But I just can't thank you enough because we really believe that programs like this are so critical to allow kids to be their best selves, unplug from technology. I've heard lots of cultural exchange here. That's a big part of what we do. And we really feel like a well-designed summer program can be the antidote to the decline in social and emotional skills that our youth struggle with today. And at Kenlin, we help kids develop their teamwork, communication, self-confidence through the fun activities we have led by our staff from around the world. So thank you once again, and I just hope that you can continue this program for 2025. The last few speakers, Marilyn Garrett, Mindy Skillet, Chris Davis. So my name is Chris Davis. I'm in Trustee Dodge's area, and I wasn't planning to speak tonight. I'm co-owner of my mom's mole, a local food business, also co-founder of Santa Cruz Black, a local nonprofit. And I apologize to you. Just a week ago, on a board meeting, I was called an arrogant young man. And I'm twice his age. And so that is just unacceptable, especially in a setting like this. And that's, the, that's really the main reason I'm speaking. But I also want to talk about, you know, if your opponent, you know, you have that beef, that, he doesn't deserve that reaction. Just because your opponent, when talking about civics, that has nothing to do with him. I'm also going to talk about CRE. You know, I might not look like the average Watsonville resident, but I've lived here for a decade. So I've known this city. I've learned so much. My life is ethnic studies. It's ridiculous that, there, that this is even a conversation. Like, I've been in these conversations about CRE. It makes no sense that ethnic studies is not happening. Thank you. for 20 years, and I talked to Daniel and all these students who have been here. The most important thing is health and what's promoting health. That's a top priority. I want to read from Learn the Rest, or Knowledge, Action, and Health. The reality of our health. The United States is sicker than ever. The U.S. spends more than any other country on health care, yet it has more chronic health issues than any other country. Half of all adults in the U.S. have a chronic illness, and nearly half will eventually die of cancer. We are exposed to a cocktail of synthetic chemicals from birth. Polluted air and water, electrical frequencies that used to belong only to space, and processed food laced with pesticides, lots of that here in Colorado Valley, by the way, to which we add pharmaceutical drugs, including vaccines, to the mix. Mix pharmaceutical drugs and vaccines contain multiple synthetic chemicals that should never be put into the body. They are part of the reason we have skyrocketing chronic health issues that have somehow become the new norms in our society. But this is not normal, and science is clear. 
Most, if not all, of these health issues can be linked to pharmaceutical treatments and drugs. In fact, the healthcare system is now the leading cause of death in the U.S. And Learn the Risk puts out these cards I'll give you that shows an apple. If an apple contained aluminum, mercury, formaldehyde, MSG, would you eat it? These are in vaccines. Anything injected is far more dangerous. Miss Garrett, that's your time. Eat. We need to move to so the next speaker. I Thank you. you this. Our next speaker, please step up. Good evening. I'm here to set the record straight. The only person who needs to get fact-checked is you, Mr. Soto. The student trustee simply repeated a comment that we all heard you make, and you said, the ignorance of the community. That's it. That's what was said, and that's what was heard. And if you are not willing to listen to how your actions affect the community, you should not be up there. Okay? And it is not up to you. Obviously, the student trustee is here. You don't decide. It was not your decision. And there is no reason for you to make threats other than the fact that you are intimidated. And that's not OK. My second point is, how much longer will this go on? Who is overcounting? Who? Where is the oversight here? Who? Where is the accountability for the board? How many more disrespectful comments are going to be allowed to be made to the community, to the student trustee? Who's next? Who's next? That's my question. How long will this go on? How long will this be tolerated? It's not OK. You expect respect. You want respect and empathy from the community. In your governing handbook, it says that's what the board will do. You're not doing that. You're not doing that. It's been meeting after meeting. I've heard comments and more comments, and it's not okay. So where's the accountability? Thank you. Organization comments. Now is the time we hear from our employee organizations. Each will have five minutes. We will start with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, 8.1. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Hi, I'm Bobby Grenier. I'm the district's only curriculum math coach for grades three through five. I service all the district's elementary schools and work with the third through fifth grade teachers. I have worked hard to achieve academic excellence that I in turn bring to the district. Working with our elementary teachers is one of the great joys of my life and I absolutely love my job. I'm here today to speak to you about aligning our district's curriculum and community goals with our district's HR practices. Could you go to the next slide? Oh, do I have it? When we returned from COVID, there was a severe teacher shortage and the district reached out to the TOSAS coaches and specialists to fill vacancies that HR was unable to fill because of the shortages. Prior to COVID, it's my understanding that tapping the TOSAS coaches and specialists was not the norm. Here we are years later from COVID and that teacher shortage is not an issue anymore. 
but the HR practice of tapping the toes as coaches and specialists to fill the vacancies has continued. So I'm here today to explain to you why this practice is bad for our teachers and students and help you to understand why keeping the TOSAs, coaches, and specialists in the classrooms is absolutely essential. Plus, it's also part of the state of the district's community messaging. This is from last year's state of the district. And remember that I'm a math coach. Is that your time? That is your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bobby Marshall, proud PVFT member. Trustee Esqueda, I started teaching after you left, but I teach at your junior high alma, alma mater. Uh, my son was in your class, and your son, and uh, these guys are what give me hope for our future. Uh, we are proud of you, you are making us proud. Keep doing it, thank you. <laughs> Trustee Soto, um, I wanna thank you for motivating me to get out of my pajamas and come down here tonight. Um, you know, I, I, I just, as a teacher, could not Stand by and listen to an adult talk to a student that way. I trust and believe that our union would never stand behind a teacher who talked to a student that way, and I will stand behind that. I, I come, I've had disagreements with many of you, and I do my best. I don't know if I always succeed, but I try to be respectful. And I will sit down with any of you at any time and, and talk, however uncomfortable it may be. Um, I was at that meeting. You may have felt that you were talking to one person. I felt you were talking to me. I was one of four community members who stood up and said, I think we should have an election. Congratulations, I look forward to seeing your tenure. That was nothing against you, I didn't even know you then. Uh, but I stand behind it. Um, but you said the community's ignorance because of what we said. And so I did hear that. Um, I hope that you will be humble enough to consider apologizing tonight publicly. And uh, Trustee Escada, please, Keep doing what you're doing, and don't be intimidated by those bigger than you who want to intimidate. Um, regarding the finances, I do want to say one thing about that with the election. I also would love to find out what the, I asked last year, when we got through the PN day situation, I would like to know what the district spent on that, because I'm willing to bet that it is as much as it would have cost for an election. And that was something that many of you voted for. And so rather than saying we don't understand, recognize we have different perspectives, different understandings, but we do understand. We sit at these meetings, we watch the numbers, and we are engaged. Thank you very much. spoke out for our community. I'm an Aptos resident and I would have liked to have had that vote as anybody would want to, but welcome. Uh, Daniel, I am appalled by the response that Trustee Soto provided to your articulate representation, presentation sharing the student body sentiment. You have done a stellar job, thoughtful, providing thoughtful input at these meetings and we are proud of you. At Monday's meeting, I shared some essential qualities that we are hopeful for in a board that we are hoping to create. We want support for educators and support staff. When educators and support staff feel valued and secure, they can dedicate themselves fully to, sp to specific positions. Focus on student needs and ensure we do not take austerity measures at their ed educational expense. Open communication, a trustee who models and engages in respectful dialogue with teachers, staff, students, and parents. Collaboration and partnership with all stakeholders, including the unions, because we are a vital ally in the district's mission to improve schools. And finally, we must be a role model for equity and inclusion. A commitment to promoting equity means addressing disparities and ensuring that all students have access to the resources and opportunities they deserve and advocate for, such as our high school students and parents who have spent a year advocating for the return of the community responsive education contract with Dr. Tintiango Hubales. This is not just a moral obligation. It is essential for creating a just and thriving community. 
Again, together we rise, and together we can create a brighter, more equitable future for our schools, and most importantly, for our students. It's election season, folks. And this is the time for the adults to vote for Gabriel Medina, yeah. for trustee area three. Because we need an adult who will be a leader that does not resort to tearing down students. Yeah. Like Daniel Esqueda, who's done nothing but be the most incredible young man on this dais. <laughs> so thank you. And you know, I just was in my head thinking that the Maya Angelou quote, you know, when someone shows you who they are, who they are, believe them the first time. And you have done nothing but remind us at almost every single board meeting, Soto, of who you are. And it shouldn't be the person sitting up there. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, Board of Trustees, Dr. Heisey, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Gustavo Paz. Everybody knows me as Gus. A little history, I was born and raised here in Watsonville. Went to a messy school, had some great teachers. Went to Rolling Hills, had some great teachers. And I went to Watsonville High School, had some really great teachers. Um, I was, uh, our past president moved on, and um, I took, huh? Oh, yeah, trailer. And I, I got the seat now. And um, I'm just here to represent our classified employees um, and stuff that's going on. Just a couple of things. I'm kind of running, running a little late. I had practice with some kids that I'm um, trying to reach some goals and potentials in the sport of wrestling. So always getting back to the community is very important. Um, we have a couple of things. Uh, First one is um, we're getting ready to start negotiations, which is going to be coming up, and we have a date set for uh, the 11, 20, 24. So get our group together for that and get that going. Um, I don't speak very much, so I'm just speaking for what we have going on. Um, I think the last time I spoke here, I got inducted into the Hall of Fame, so it's kind of nervous. Got to speak to some great students. Um, we had a meeting yesterday, our chapter meeting, and our members voted to endorse um, Area 2, uh, Georgia Acosta, Area 3, Oscar Soto, and Area 6, Adam Scout. So I just wanted to let you guys know. Other than that, that's all I have. And the best thing about everything right now is wrestling season's right around the corner of November, and have a great weekend. Well, that's not Check, check, check. Good evening, Board of Trustees, President Acosta, Dr. Contreras. How's it going tonight? Mike Floor I'm here on behalf of CWA, the union that represents substitutes in our district. I had a lot to say tonight, and I even brought a colleague, a fellow steward um, from the local, but our elections just started today. And I've been advised to keep things very general and be very careful because of our receivership. So basically, we are making tremendous strides to qualify to get out of receivership. We're going to have a local board and a local chapter functioning again so we can kind of work more independently. We can endorse candidates in the future and become a real actual union shop. And I had ideas tonight, like I said, to demonstrate that. Um, but I'm going to keep it very general and just let you know that we are crawling out of our receivership status. Um, probably be out of receivership in a couple months. I can't guarantee anything. There's formalities involved. I'm sure you're all very aware of the types of things that I'm discussing. So with that being said, 
on the ground at the schools and in the district, I've been working a lot with Brian Saxon, like I mentioned last meeting. He's been amazingly communicative and fair. I've had a handful of investigatory meetings with other substitutes, and just had one this afternoon, in fact, and he commented how nice it is that there's actually a steward, and that makes his protocol for counseling substitutes. We have a sub shortage right now, so just flicking subs away if they get caught up in some controversy is not for the district's best interest. And so he has told me how appreciative he is of CWA's, the relationship with CWA in the district. And I agree with him. So that's progress in the right direction. Um, I've also been subbing a lot. I'm in the season where I sub. I do the LPAC testing as well. My boss is right back there. You're going to hear from him later. It's good to see him here. So um, the subbing landscape is a bit tenuous at the moment. Things are pretty sensitive. And if you say the wrong thing, you end up in the seat talking with Brian. And if I spoke to a student the way I heard Soto speak to a student tonight, I'd probably end up in an investigatory meeting with Brian Saxton. So that's all I'm going to say there. I heard what it was, and I don't know. I don't even know where that came from. Um, I'm trying not to be controversial these days. Due to the nature of my continuing evolving in the role of my stewardship, my relationship with the district, my relationship with schools, and my relationship with the local in San Jose. So that's pretty much all I have to say tonight. Welcome interim trustee, Dr. Navarro, if I got that right. Um, it's nice to see a new face on the board, or it's interesting to see a new face on the board. We'll see what happens. But anyway, that's what I have to say tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And have a good night, everybody. Thanks. For Pabam, Harrow Valley Association of Managers, do we have anyone from Pabam? Good evening, President Acosta, Superintendent Contreras, Board and Cabinet. My name is Peggy Pugh, I'm the Executive Director for Teaching and Learning for PBUSD. And on behalf of the Harrow Valley Association of Managers, we are honored to welcome you, Dr. Navarro, to your seat. Um, we are grateful that you said uh, you would be willing to take this on. We uh, know it takes a courageous leader to do that, and we are grateful for that, so thank you. As a district, we care very much about our students' growth and their achievement, and we were happy to hear your comments about that at the um, interviews the other evening, so thank you so much. It is a very busy fall season for Pavan members and supporting our schools in a myriad of ways, from classroom walks to student performances to athletic events, daily meals, bus rides, and of facilities improvements. We are extremely proud of our Pavan members who are collaborating together as site and district level leaders to work with staff and families to inform our whole community about Measure M. Our leaders are presenting to school site councils all over the district sometimes multiple times a day, to be sure our community has the information they need to make informed decisions. We value very much the democracy in this community, and we're grateful to the leadership of our, all of you here who are taking the opportunity to lead and represent those who you represent, so thank you. We celebrate our expanded learning leaders and staff for the work they do each day to care for our students in our after-school program Tomorrow is Lights On After School Day. It's a national day to celebrate our after school and expanded learning programs daily across 31 sites. We have over 5,000 students staying in expanded learning. Sites will be celebrating all week. Congratulations to this very dedicated team of educators. Thank you. Thank you. I will now move us to uh, Item number nine, consent agenda. Consent items are routine items that come before the board. Do we have any public speakers to the consent agenda? Yeah, we have one, Marilyn Garrett.
what number item remind me of? Uh, 9.4, Lexa contract renewal and uh, additions. Um, if students have trouble with the skill, the program takes them to an extra learning and reteach practice screen before continuing on their path. All this learning with Wi-Fi, microwave radiation, screen time is actually harmful to students. It would be interesting to see how they might thrive or improve without this exposure. And some of the studies show symptoms of microwave exposure. And many of us are aware of having these symptoms. Many people who have them aren't aware of the cause. Neurological headaches, dizziness, and nausea, memory and concentration difficulties, insomnia, depression, and anxiety, fatigue and weakness, numbing and tingling, muscling, muscle and joint pains, cardiac, heart palpitations, shortness of breath, heart arrhythmia, pain in the eyes, burning in the eye, other problems, digestive dehydration. It is contrary to promoting health and education to have children sitting in microwave radiation environments, exposure from Wi-Fi and other wireless technology, even though it's popular. This should be removed. It should be an Ethernet wired system. So when I see this here, I'm, I'm appalled. I'm just so disturbing. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented by staff? I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first. Can I have a second? I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, any abstaining? Any, I'm sorry, any opposing? Any abstaining? That will carry 6-0-1. I'm now going to move us to um, our action items, number 11, 11.1, uh, to reschedule the December board meetings. This report will be presented by me, uh, Board President Georgia Acosta, and Dr. Heather Contreras, Superintendent of PBUSD Schools. Um, so the board needs to reschedule our organizational meeting for December 11th to December 18th. In an election year, a school district's organizational meeting must be held on a day within 15-day period that commences with the date upon which a governing board elected at that election takes office, which is the second Friday in December. That's in accordance with the Assembly Bill 2449 and Education Code 5017. Um, staff has therefore respectfully requested the board to reschedule our board meetings for December for the December 4th meeting to December 11th, and for our board's organizational meeting for December 11th to December 18th to accommodate the needed changes to our organizational board meeting and staff needs. Dr. Kuchars, do you have anything to add? No. Okay, seeing none, do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Seeing none, um, then I'll bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any questions, comments, or deliberation from the board? Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the um, staff recommendation um, and request to move our December 4th meeting to December 11th and to move our currently scheduled December 11th organizational meeting to December 18th? I just make a motion to support action item 11.1. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. I have a first. Can I have a second? Second. I have a first and I have a second. Any other discussion or deliberation from the board? 
Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Thank you everyone for your understanding on that item. And now we will move us to 12, our report and discussion items, and we will start with 12.1, the 2023 2024 um, CAA SPP data presentation. This report will be presented by Josh Phillips, Mr. Phillips, our coordinator of assessment and accountability. Good evening, Board of Trustees. President Acosta, Dr. Contreras, everyone in attendance. My name is Josh Phillips. I'm the coordinator of research accountability and assessment for the district, and I'm here to present to you the 23-24 testing data from the Smart Balance Assessment Consortium, which is the California State Test. The vision of PBUSD is that our vision is every student will graduate ready to share their unique skills and abilities and be a positive contributing member of their community and their world. And our mission is that we are committed to cultivating a nurturing environment where every student thrives academically, socially, and emotionally, empowering them to flourish in a dynamic and evolving world. The goals for our district are here now, you'll probably hear some more about them in a little bit, but the two goals that are currently on the books that apply to our testing data are goal three, to provide academic challenges for all students, support and maintain programs that are successful and help build new opportunities so we keep all students engaged in their learning. And goal six, to provide a consistent and strategic program to achieve the goal of English acquisition. So what is the SPAC? The SPAC is an acronym, as I'm sure as the board you know, there are many acronyms in education, and this is the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, which is a test designed to assess our students in all of, throughout California in English and math. All students in grades three through eight and grade 11 take the SBAC at the end of the school year. In PPOSD last year, the 2023-24 school year, we had 9,128 students in these grades. So that's, as you can see, 100% of the sample group. Of that um, group, there were 3,318 English learners, 3,297 who were designated English only, 2,193 um, RFIP, we designated fluent and proficient, 312 initially fluent English proficient, IFEP students, and of that group of 9,128, 1,612 received special services. So you can see the percentage rates there on the right. Do note um, that the 18% in special services encompasses the entire group. Uh, it's not separate um, from the English learners. Here's a timeline of our testing in PPUSD. SBAC is there on the right. Tonight we're discussing the scores from our Smarter Balance test at the end of the school year. Um, we do have another battery of assessments that takes place throughout the year. That's our math testing. Um, it takes place three times throughout the year. In the fall, we get a baseline measure of where our students are presently. In winter, we get a, a formative measure so we know how they're progressing. At the end of the year, we get that summative measure in that. And we can track that code throughout their learning at PBOSD. We've noticed um, after some analysis that those MAP scores and SBAC scores do correlate quite closely. So if you were to score higher on an SBAC test, you would like this to also score higher on a MAP test. So we're confident that those measures that we're using throughout the year to monitor students are effective and reflective of the students' progress in their actual learning. When looking at the scores, and you can see PBUSD there highlighted in the center, those are our scores from last year and the last three years. Um, in comparison to surrounding districts and our local county and the state, um, we last year in the met and exceeded range, 25% of PBUSD students um, achieved in met or exceeded rating in ELA. And on the right hand side, you can see 17.55% um, achieved met or exceeded in math. Um, if you click the live link on your presentation at the top, you can see how the comparative districts were discovered. There's a website called eddata.org, and you can sort and analyze districts that are com comparable to PBUSD. So those districts that are listed on the screen have several demographics in English learners, in um, free and reduced lunch students, in um, other factors, and size. Every year, the data forecast from the previous year is released in October, so that's why this presentation is coming now. It's just been released over the last couple of weeks. Um, if you go to the CASP website, which is linked there, 
you'll see graphics that look similar to the circles there. Those are 25%, 17.55% um, net or exceeded rates in ELA and math, respectively. Uh, but today, I'll also be showing you these visualizations in, um, from our data management platform called EduClimber. Um, all of our PVOSD teachers have access to this program, so they can see constantly um, how their students are performing. Uh, you can group students by levels, you can group students by proficiencies, um, so st staff, both administrators and teachers, have access to this data and can analyze it, and we're working with them to do that consistently and reflect on teaching practices. Um, today, also, I'm going to share, share this data with you in the frame of our LCAP goals, that's our local um, control and accountability plans. This is how our district allocates funding based on their priorities. Um, so, goal one, college and career readiness. Goal two, positive school culture. Goal three, supporting foster youth. Goal four, supporting students who receive special services. And goal five, supporting multilingual learners. So for goal one, that college and career readiness and academic success, this is pretty much everything the district does. This is teaching students within our boundaries. Um, so this is pretty much where most of the data lies. Um, as mentioned, a little, little blurry there on the screen, but we went down about a percent in net and exceeded rate in ELA from 2022 to 23 to the 23-24 school year. Um, overall, the bands of proficiency were quite consistent, um, which you can see there on your screens, uh, but we did see a slight drop in the ELA data. We do notice, though, when analyzing closely by grade level, that as students progress through the grade levels, their ELA proficiency does actually increase. Uh, by the time they get to 11th grade, um, the met and exceeded rate is quite a bit higher than in the earlier grades. And in comparison to the state, by grade level, we do see quite a similar trend line in those growth patterns. So students in the lower grades um, are growing slightly and then growing significantly towards their 11th grade year, right in line with state averages, closing the gap slightly between PVUSD's rates and state averages. And this data was quite telling for us as far as the support of some of our most recent efforts to get students to come to school more consistently. Um, in a sample size of the students from last year who tested, there was a group that attended school 80% of the time or less, so 2,264 students in this group, and their data is on the left. So in ELA proficiency, those students met or exceeded the standard 17%, 17 rate. Compared to students who attended school 81% of the time or more, a group of 6,180 students, they achieved a proficiency of 30%. Um, so that's not quite double, nearly double the met and exceeded rate for students who are attending school more regularly. Um, so we're confident that that's in support of our efforts to get our students in school to raise their achievement. And then we'll do this all again for math. Uh, math achievement stayed about steady. The bands you can see um, didn't change much at all. Um, about a half percent increase between 22-23 to 23-24 overall district-wide. We do notice that by grade level, the proficiencies don't grow quite as much in the upper grades. Uh, lower grades seem to have a slightly higher proficiency um, relative to some of the higher grades. And compared to the state, you can see the trend line is quite similar. Um, though our achievement is quite a bit lower than the state at the 11th grade, we do notice a strong uh, closing of that gap, where as lower grades are upwards of 20%, uh, by the time that in the 11th grade, our students on average are just about a 12% gap. Uh, but similar, in fact, more telling data in math when it comes to students who are attending versus not attending as regularly. That same group of students who attended 80% or less of the time last year achieved a 10% net or exceeded rate on the math test, um, while those who attended more regularly we're at 22%, which is quite a lot higher. Um, so we are, we are pleased to see that those students who are coming to school are getting more out of their education. We really want to get those students who aren't coming as often in their seats so we can raise their achievement levels. LCAP goal two is the one on this list that probably doesn't get reflected in the SBAC data quite as much, but I did want to share with you a couple of measures that we're using in the district to measure um, school culture and family engagement. Many of our students in the district are utilizing a program called Sun to Grow, where they'll check in weekly on an online platform um, to rate their current emotion. They can enter a feeling or a statement of some kind. They can write it or they can select a pre-selected one. And their teachers then have an opportunity to reflect and respond to them. 
Um, so this is a good way for students and teachers to check in with each other, particularly in larger groups where maybe a teacher doesn't have a chance to do that as regularly because of the size of classes. Um, and the engagement is measured by our Youth Truth Survey. So last year, all um, PVUC parents were given the opportunity to respond and share their feedback on the district. And one of our highest ratings actually was engagement, um, in which staff or parents have rated our schools as accessible and informative. So that, that's a good measure for us to, to begin with and continue with. LCAP Goal 3 is supporting foster youth. Um, this data is obviously telling. This is a small sample size. Last year, 10 students fell in this category and were tested. Um, so it's not a, a data point that is of a large group, but it does definitely reflect the students in this group are, are struggling and the efforts the district is currently making to support them by preparing preemptive student improvement plans and student support plans is necessary uh, because right now this group of students is probably not feeling um, as, as serviced. They need a lot of help. Similar in math, um, and probably, as you can see, a more challenge for our foster youth. So it definitely supports the efforts of the district to get these students as much help as they need. LCAP goal number four is supporting students who receive special services and students with disabilities. Um, similar to our earlier graphs, you can see not a lot of movement either way. And we do notice that these are obviously much lower achievement rates compared to the district as a whole. Um, which definitely um, supports the need for continuing efforts to assist these students. Um, it's of note, students with special needs can be a large group of students of the variants of disabilities. It can be in a special day class, it could be an RSP student, it could be a speech and language um, support. Um, many of our students who are in a special day class might take the California alternate assessment, and that data is not reflected in this SBAC data. They take a separate assessment. Mm -hmm. Similar in math, um, consistent rates, though um, quite a bit lower than our district overall. And finally, LCAP goal number five is supporting multilingual learners. So this graph is showing the difference in achievement based on um, our students' English proficiency. On the far left, you can see English learners. These are students who came to PVUSD or came to a California school, took a home language survey, and it was determined that their home language was a language other than English. They then took the LPAC in which they were um, designated as an English learner. And this group of students you can see is not achieving at the same level as their peers. Um, data that you can take from this slide that we're encouraged by is that our students who are redesignated, that's the graph on the far right, those are students who were English learners who went through the reclassification process, are achieving at nearly identical rates as their English only counterparts. And similarly, um, that Graph second from the right, IFEP, Initially Fluent English Proficient Students. Those are students who came to our districts um, biliterate and bilingual with skills in two languages, English and a language other than English. Um, and they're actually outperforming all other groups, uh, which supports the asset mindset of our district and supporting our students with skills they have. Similar in math, though we do see the RFEP group has slipped a little bit in math um, as opposed to the other groups. We do also notice, of course, English learners are still struggling in math um, at, at this time. This graph is not from SPAC, this is from LPAC. The LPAC test is the test that will um, assess our English learners' progress. Um, what this shows us is that over time, students are reclassifying. Um, each band you see there is an LP level, which is an um, English language proficiency progress indicator, um, which shows us that students are growing and reclassifying over time. We want to see those bars getting smaller as they advance through the grades, because as they come to us in kindergarten or, or first grade, they're classified as an English learner, they go through the reclassification process and gradually are reclassifying. So what we've observed from this data is that students are showing increased proficiency in ELA uh, as they advance through the grade levels. Reclassified students are performing closely to those who have English as a first language, and IFEP students are performing higher than all other groups. Students who attend school 81% of the time or more achieved significantly higher in ELA and math. By 11th grade, PVOSC students were closing the achievement gap in ELA, um, not as so much as in math. Students are showing increased challenge in mathematics as they advance through the grade levels. Students designated as English only, RFEP and IFEP, showed less proficiency in math than in ELA. And students with IEPs demonstrate challenges attaining mastery 
on all standards um, in both subjects. And PVUSD scores are largely similar to 2223, indicating that refinement of our district system needs to continue in order to adapt to the meeting needs, meeting needs of our students. I will yield to public comments. Same token, if you took Aptos out of the PBUSD data, we suck the southern part. Well, let's get sucked, doesn't it? So the, uh, the English explanation that he gave on ELA, it's really due to dropouts. Your, your poor English language people are dropping out of school, so your scores are going to go up. Now, by the same token, what he says is that they go to higher levels. That's wrong. It gets worse for math. So for special needs kids, terrible on math and English. The same for English language learners. Uh, no proficiency to speak of. And it all goes back to you've got a bunch of students that we don't have a program on how to improve. How do you improve this district? That's the challenge for all of us in this room moving forward. Thank you. I appreciate that. Marilyn? There's a lot of poverty, a lot of farm workers in this community who have very difficult work to do. And I, as a teacher, taught bilingual classes. I retired in 2000. And they all want a better life for their children. But we live in such a um, a society of exploitation. I just heard a program by David Bacon on farm workers, and he was talking also about the Pajaro Valley and people who harvest the strawberries, the narrow rows that they're bending over all the time with back problems, getting paid very little. So we have 
many children of uh, farm workers in this district. You also spoke about um, special needs of children. And I heard a talk on vaccines the other night. And I think in the figure of the, he was a pediatrician and attorney, Richard Fox gave was a, 13% of children in the schools are in special need classes. That's huge. And he attributed it to adverse reactions to vaccines in part. So we have to ask what, what toxins, what economic conditions are affecting our schools and our children? And in a capitalist system, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So a lot of problems with that. Supporting a time and a multilingual. Ms. Garrett, that is your time. We you. people. Ms. Garrett, that is your time. So it's time to bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Is there any deliberation from the board? Trustee DeSerpa. So we have we had made some gains a few years ago in COVID. And last year we were leaderless essentially for a year. So what what would account for some of the reduction in achievement that we're seeing? Um, that's hard to say over the large scale that we have in the district. I don't know if this is to talk about this. Yeah, right. Um, in some schools, rates went up significantly. So if you were to analyze it by a school individually, some went up and some went down. Um, so it's hard to say exactly what would have caused it in each site. I know that at some sites, there was tremendous effort put into preparing for the test and getting the students accustomed to the format and um, refining teaching practices to um, better those scores. And then also, of course, we're doing many things that we can throughout the curriculum and instruction department to improve our teaching and refine uh, our practices to make sure our students are better prepared. Um, but as far as the reduction by 1%, it, it's hard to pinpoint one reason exactly for that. Um, but when I, as I said earlier, when I look at the rates by school site, many sites went up um, by 2 3 percent or some even more, and some sites went down um, by, by as much or more. Can't, I can't put an exact answer on why it went down 1% in one year in the LA. Math went up half a percent, so it's kind of an even level. Is Claudia here tonight? She is. She is. Oh, I can't see her. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if you're, you're prepared to, or maybe Heather could answer this, but under you know under SIPs and under maps like so maps we are, are checking our kids achievement um, or learning at three different times of the year so when we when it's clear that we are not particularly make like making the mark at mid-year are we what are we doing to help those schools do better I'll speak to that a little bit. I wasn't here last year to look at the mid strides that adjustments that might have happened in response to what students were doing. I do know we have intervention teachers at our sites uh, that do help to look at the uh, assessment results that are taken throughout the year and then respond to uh, how the students are performing. I think in answer to what were some of the reasons that contributed to the flat and actually decreased scores on CASP, we're still leaning into that right now to analyze that and having different meetings at school sites where we're, teachers are analyzing that and um, looking at their CASP results individually and looking what some of the next steps are going to be. That's great. And do you have any, I mean, maybe this is a completely other presentation, but like what's your plan? 
So we will be bringing forward some information regarding what the plan is and actually the next presentation for tonight is on our district strategic goals which will target some of the things that we intend to do to help uh, excellence in academics. Did that suffice your questions? Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Milano Scout? Yeah, yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, I believe I asked at a board meeting about a year ago. Um, I guess my question is to this test, this particular test, because I was asking uh, how many tests are third graders are subjected to? And the English, the English language learners are subjected to lots and lots of tests. Um, how are how does this test interplay with those other tests? And I mean, is this all supposed to be one big test mountain, or is it all building into this? Can we explain the rationale and how, for that? To a degree, yeah. I actually watched last year's board meeting when you asked those questions in preparation for this question. So <laughs> here we go. I'm gonna do my best. Um, the SBAC, which we were discussing tonight, is mandated by the state for all students, grades 3 through 8 and 11. So everyone takes that one. Uh, to your specific question, um, English learners take the LPAC, sometimes twice a year if they're an initial, if they just got here to this country, to the state, um, to a US school, they'll take the initial to determine their reading level, their English proficiency level. Um, and then all English learners take the summative assessment around February in our district, and that's going to determine how they're progressing in their English acquisition. So to your question, um, an English learner who has already been in a U.S. school for more than one year will take the MAP tests, spring, winter, and, or fall, winter, spring. They'll take the LPAC in February and the SPAC in spring. So that's five that we, that we have them do regularly. That, of course, is excluding you know, classroom level tests and things like that. And, and are we saying this test is the most important person? Um, for an English learner, I, I would say that it's a split importance between the SBAC and the LPAC, although our reclassification criteria is based on their map performance. So for an English learner, they, they all have significance. Um, for all of our students, they do as well. From the perspective of that we're, we're tracking our student progress through MAP mainly throughout the year, because SBAC doesn't give us as much feedback on particular domains and where they're strong or weak. Um, and it, because it only happens once a year, we don't have as much um, ongoing formative data to inform instruction where with MAP tests, since we do that three times a year, we can dig into those results and determine the student's strengths a little more closely. And that's what uh, Dr. Contreras was mentioning earlier about building those reading groups. That's what I was mentioning earlier with the Edge of Climate platform, which allows our teachers to dig into data closely and, um, and inform instruction. Hey, thank you. Just, uh, just, I do want to point out that uh, the CASP test is a really important measure because it is our state accountability measure. So when you're looking at importance of tests, that's the one. <laughs> okay, okay. And then, because um, I heard through the grapevine that our middle schools, a couple of them are struggling, have gotten some kind of designation. I don't know if there's something like that's real predicted by what we can see in this data. And that, may, and if, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that some of our the English language learners, the, the testing there, the learning is, the numbers weren't looking great. Is there any correlation that we're seeing prior to middle school that we, we can try to address? I know we can see your next presentation, but I just want to know. No, I think you're referring to our CSI schools, and those are schools that have been designated as schools in need of assistance. We had 10 schools that were designated with that designation last February. And if you'll remember during my interview process, I yes, yes, brought yes, those up. Yes. Uh, we are engaging, and some of those are middle schools and some of those are elementary right. schools. We're currently engaging in a variety of strategies to support those schools, and there will be an upcoming uh, board report on what we're doing there, what schools were identified, and, uh, and our next step actions for that as well. Great, great, thank you. I guess, yeah, to the point of my original question is, are, is there all the tests that were mandated, whether it's state, federal, or we're mandating at BDUSD, are they, are they actually working? Are they actually helping them? And that's, that's my question. And that's a bigger question than I have a quick answer tonight, but thank you. Yeah, the SBAC is that final measure, the summative, how did we do at the end of the year? It's, it's not always 
as useful as informing in the moment instructional decisions in the classrooms, and that's why we have the additional tests like MAP or our Dibbles testing that help to inform instructional decision making. So they all kind of work together. And just on the final point, I wanted to redirect you to this one, which, which does show, um, based on the data analysis, that the SPAC test and the MAP test do correlate closely as far as actual um, achievement and progress. So when the students take that SPAC test in the spring, um, we're seeing that their achievement is in line with their achievement on MAP. So that data that we're collecting throughout the year is informing us of, of their actual levels, which is helping us to inform instruction and create those support structures. Trustee Galanosco, does that satisfy your questions? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Trustee Doug De Navarro. I don't think you're, but actually, a bunch of questions. Um, sorry. I was wondering, I, I agree with the community member here who obviously sees as a big concern with these scores, and as a parent and a physician and a person who went through the public school system to get where I am today, this data is appalling. And we have a lot of work to do in this district. Um, one of the things I would ask is, do you have this data separated out by site and at the elementary level by individual teachers so that you can see which teachers are doing well and maybe use them as a mentor for other teachers who are struggling to do the same material? That's definitely internal data that we utilize. Yes, we have that site data and our um, district level leadership team is working with site supervisors to make sure they're using that data to inform their instruction and push where they need to push. Yes. Um, and then what resources specifically are we doing, especially for our English as uh, second language students, you know, um, for credit recovery, like on weekends or after school programs to help bring them up to speed? That's not one that I have. Does somebody have that one? We do have a variety of programs designed to support our English learners, including English language development that happens within the school day. Our programming after school does have academic components that would help with language development. Um, I think there's another part of your question that maybe I missed. I'm just wondering, and you know, what we're doing to make this more engaging and more fun for these students, because you know, like going to school on Saturday is usually seen as a punishment. Yeah. But if you do something engaging and fun and creative, then it's seen not as a punishment. Um, and you know, as a mom of two students in the district, who, you know. They know my expectations are high. Um, they, my little one, really struggles to enjoy school, you know. And what can we do to make school more engaging and more enjoyable for students? I think part of that is just the facilities that they're in, and hopefully Measure M can do a lot to help that. Because specifically, like I haven't been to all the school sites, but Aptos Junior High is a disaster. And um, you know, We're working on. <laughs> I would I would really like to see some improvement at, at both those schools and most of the schools in the district. But I think that maybe we underestimate, like students want to learn, but they want to be engaged in their learning. How do we actually, you know, support them in that? And you know, in my world of worlds, we would test all kids at kindergarten to figure out what their learning differences are and how we could best support them because we don't all learn the same. And so, you know, I look forward to seeing your plan on what you want to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Navarro. Did that satisfy your questions? Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, thank you for report. Uh, just, just a quick question. As a father who has a senior year at Watsonville High, uh, my daughter has told me that sometimes with all this testing, because I say we have three a year, do we really need three a year? There have been discussions about um, the level of testing. I know it was discussed last year at, at a similar report, um, and we are definitely discussing that at the district district level about where we might be able to curtail that to, to meet those um, requests. Yes, Trustee Dodge, it. that is a, a discussion that we're holding at multiple levels right now and asking ourselves exactly, exactly that same thing. I actually uh, spoke with our PDFT president recently about that same issue and as well as cabinet to really analyze that and see what we can, what, what do we need and what and what is just too much. As a daughter, I think she knows everything. <laughs> She's like, oh, well, dad, you know, I mean, we have these tests, you know, sometimes they're into it, but then sometimes, like, they're, they know there's no consequences, so they're just, and so maybe that might be affecting the numbers more or less, but I just wanted to. And you bring up a good point, because one of the things that we have been really hyper-focused on this year is student voice. 
So we do need to take into account how these types of assessments and the actions we're taking in the classrooms land on our students. It's good information. As, Thank you. As a side note, I can tell you that my 14-year-old, who I consider one of my consultants, said that if there was actually some sort of reward for doing well in these testing, that you would get better engagement because they know they don't count for anything, so they don't really try very hard. Anyone else? Trustee Bolanoska. Yeah, just one question I got from a parent, a PBOST staff member, uh, an observation was that sometimes, and her question to me, and I'm asking the question to, her, to the group, is um, sometimes she feels students are unnecessarily classified as English language learners when they actually are already bilingual coming into our schools, but if Spanish is the primary language spoken at home, and I think maybe, um, so our, does our district financially does that affect the finances of our district? Do we encourage that? Because a lot of our kids are actually are bilingual, which is great, but the LPAC test out here is very hard, and then it's can, certain pathways are prevented from taking electives in middle school, and right. so is that? Can, Those are challenging uh, situations for sure. Uh, the designation of a student being an English learner or not an English learner is based on the home language survey that students are administered when, uh, that a parent actually is administered when they sign a student up, register a child for school. And so that classification comes with if this parent registered that they speak another language. And then we engage in testing the student to see their language level, which then gives them their uh, language designation and what level they're at, and then what services we would provide to help them. So They do uh, take a test? They always take a test? Mm -hmm. uh, if, if they indicate that they speak a yes. language other than English at home, yes, then they're administered a test, an assessment. And I would also say those home language surveys can sometimes be quite um, confusing, so we usually follow up when the, one of those is less clear. So if we see one that says sometimes English, sometimes another language, we'll usually call the family to determine like what what are you really saying with that? So we don't misclassify. I also encountered this at work a lot where people will say that English, they speak English, but really that's not their preferred language, so sometimes it's actually how you ask the question. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scout, Trustee DeSerpa. So um, for many years, we had a committee that looked at um, the dropout rate and what we could do about that. And Bill just brought up a good point. Like we haven't looked at that in a long time because for a while we were doing, I think, much, much better at trying to prevent kids from leaving school early. So I don't know if you can speak to that at all or if we can yes, have that absolutely. presented another time. Absolutely. We are we have are forming and engaging in our first ever grit meetings at our high schools. That stands for Graduation Rate Intervention Team. And the data will be specifically beginning to look at with each of our high schools. And it'll be a team of people, um, Josh included. Tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow morning. That's what we, what we get to start with, which I'm very excited about. There will be a team of people who all touch that dropout data um, as a starting point to examining what's happening with our students who may be dropping out of school. Um, and starting to analyze what supports we can put in place. And we'd be absolutely willing to do a report on that in the future and uh, what we're uncovering and some of the things that will be, that follow-up actions we'll take regarding that. Sorry, I have one more question. Um, okay, uh, just one second. Thank you, Trustee Serpa. Trustee, Dr. Navarro. I was just gonna ask, how much time away from education does all this testing take? I do not have that information, but I can bring it to you. Thank you. Is that everybody's questions and comments? Okay. Mr. Phillips, I want to thank you for your presentation tonight. It was very informative. Thank you for being here. And uh, Dr. Contreras, also thank you for your responses and the follow-ups you will have. I look forward to that as well. Thank you. I'll now move us to item 12.2, District Strategic Goals. This report will be presented by our Superintendent of PBUSD Schools, Dr. Kendra Contreras. So, we have our task data, and uh, based on that data, we do need to have some goals in place for how we're going to demonstrate improvements. And, sorry, there we go. 
Um, and so we have been working on our district strategic goals. The district strategic goals are goals that overarch all of the goals of the district. So our LCAP goals would fall under this umbrella of the district strategic goals. So getting the presentation up. I want to start with how we arrived at um, some recommendations, in the, and this is just a discussion item, not an action item yet, and we intend to bring this back after board input as an action item at our next meeting. Um, Every district needs to have these set of goals that it also accompanies the mission and vision within board policy that's dictated by Ed Code. We, in cabinet, started with the formation of the goals by just dreaming in a perfect world, what would our headlines be about our district if we were really making great strides. And we envisioned what those headlines would be. And actually, what we set our sights on is that in the US News Report on School Districts, we would be number one in the United States. So we have set lofty goals for ourselves. Um, and it will probably take us probably about seven years to get there, but we'll get there. Uh, once we envisioned that and set, settled on what did we want to be and what could we accomplish, and I truly believe that we have the team to be able to do this work, uh, we outlined different actions that we would be taking, um, broad actions, not, not specifics. Uh, and we developed a document uh, to highlight those. And you'll see the start of that document on this first slide. So we chose five goal, our overarching goal areas. These are goal areas I've talked about many times since um, starting in May 1st, and I talked about it also in my interview with the board, is that a high-functioning district addresses five key areas. The first of them is which? Academic excellence. Examining academic excellence, and that is the core mission of what we do as a district. The second is having professional learning for all employees in the system to be able to perform their job duties at a high level. The third is having a safe, warm, and welcoming environment, also known as the climate and culture in which we provide our services and is in which each of us exist um, as a community. Fourthly, we must always have fiscal responsibility. And lastly, our human resources department needs to be high functioning so that we can attract, retain, and train high quality employees at all levels. So those are our five overarching areas. You may remember that when we engaged in reorganizing um, the district office and the cabinet staff, we aligned all of the uh, job positions to those five goals. And so they are represented as my cabinet members. So cabinet looked at how we would align those goals to uh, what we see as a high functioning district and then what were some of the things that would fall under those. So as a cabinet team, we did our best thinking around what would be the actions and strategies we would engage in over the next three years to become that high functioning district that we dream of being. Uh, after we did that and engaged in our best thinking, we took the document we created, which is just a one pager. There's many, many actions that will go under this and that will be the side along documents that you'll see like the LCAP uh, plan is one of them. Uh, we took that to our teaching and learning group. Our teaching and learning group is that next layer down from cabinet. Those are our directors and our coordinators who directly work with sites and provide supports and services to the school sites and we asked for their input. And so they took all these goals that we had thought of and looked at and they marked them all up. They made um, many, many edits. We incorporated a majority of the edits. Some of them we had some deep discussion about and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then we took that document that had then been revised to reflect now the best thinking of cabinet and the best thinking of our teaching and learning group. And we brought that to the leadership group. The leadership group is 130 managers, both certificated and classified in the district, and we asked them to engage in the same process as well. They dreamed what they think would be our best goals as a district, and then they edited our document with their inputs. We then incorporated their inputs to the document, so now we had the best thinking of all leadership in the district, and then we took that document to our PBFT um, in the mechanism of the curriculum council 
and the curriculum council took that document to their sites and so I received site input from many of our district sites with their edits and corrections into the document and their best thinking and we also brought the document to CSEA. Um, I have put the document before the board in a recent board meeting that we had and this is the next step of really having the board input after everyone in the district has touched this document, seen this document, um, given input and the document has gone to many revisions, now it becomes the draft of the revisions that you would want to see um, input into there. I do want to note that some of the, the input that I received from school sites was excellent and we will be incorporating those things, but they were more of um, detailed strategies or detailed steps that we would take, not something that we, we would put in a document that's just the overarching. So I have those, and I do want those sites uh, to know that I'm keeping that input, I have that, and it will be reflected in the actions that we would take. Some of it included some things they'd like to see change with human resources, some um, things around field trips, so that wouldn't necessarily live in, in this specific document, but we will be working to address all of those. Uh, so if you go up to the detailed strategic goal one, we have a series of bullets under that, and in those bullets are the implementations of like kind of broad stroke actions and strategies that we would be working on for the next three years. Uh, what will happen next with those is that throughout each year, we'll, we, as we do that work, number one, every single board presentation uh, will be aligned to those goals because we're not going to engage in any actions that don't support the goals of the district. And so we'll be calling out how does this particular action item align to the goals of the district in every board presentation that we do. We will also come before the board three times each year with a presentation on the progress of the goals, what we've been doing with them, where we've met our goals, uh, or where we still need to do more work. So if you could scroll up through those. I, I'm not gonna read them out mainly because I can't see them <laughs> very well. <laughs> you should have them before you. Uh, so just, the, these are what we think would be our best thinking. If we can hit these targets, we know that our students will be performing at higher levels. There's some specific strategies within all of them, and those would be future board reports as we tackle those, like what are we doing for our CSI schools? What are we doing to address math? What are we doing uh, to help our English learners? Good evening. Um, I feel like with, with this, a lot of these, I feel like these are great goals. I applaud them. And I, I like a lot of it. I'm thinking like, would well, model continuation renaissance really hit a lot of these? And um, like, what I would say is you should go back to that student progress monitoring system. I feel like with SB 274, you might by de facto kind of be forced to do something like that. You should go back to variable credits and you should embrace the academic advisor model. Um, before the last school year started, there was a kid who, who caught me from who was a former graduate of Renaissance, and he's he had a kid or he had a girlfriend at Renaissance last year, and he was like, "Oh, I heard Re Renaissance is whack now." At the time, he was referring to the fact that there were more fights breaking out because historically there wasn't really a, a fighting issue because if you fought, that's it, you were out, and it was a, I, I would argue it was a safer place because of that, and, and the number one thing I would say is, and I've been saying this for a long time, you, we set the expectation and then we added supports. After COVID, the entire educational world, not just PBSD, entire, like over the hill, everywhere, we did the Pobrecito thing. And I don't think it served the community well or the art society well. Um, also, uh, there was another student who just recently graduated from Renaissance and she, she um, emailed me to, you know, about like, of her, her success. And then I was, you know, of course, very glad for her. But also, I was slightly disappointed because that was a strong student that you guys would have seen. She came here last year. She was a strong enough student to be a leader at the school. 
but then she, she after um, a teacher who gave a safe space for her was, was improperly removed because of the hostile environment there, um, she basically quit attending and then she graduated late. Now she graduated, but like my point is that we, that we have capable students, even the, like all, all our students are very capable, if we just put the supports, we can do a lot of great things. Um, Dr. Navarro, you brought up credit recovery in a fun way. You're absolutely right. I think about like how I wanted to do an extra PE. I wanted to do a PE section last year at Renaissance. The principal was down, the, the regular PE teacher was down, but then another person who had more political weight than me and was a part-timer had said, oh, well, but he's going to do something um, serious and, and they, they don't really allow it. Um, so that class didn't come. They have to hire out for it later. It's your time. I'm going to need to bring this item back to the board for the board's questions, don't, don't comments, don't discussion, and deliberation. Thank you. Um, again, I will bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any questions, comments, and deliberation from the board at this time? I look forward to hearing the full presentation. I'm really excited by the energy that you bring to the district, and I look forward to working with you. Trustee Dodge Jr. Dr. Contreras, we look forward for you to be here the next seven years mm -hmm. and to implement your program. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Anyone else? Good, good. Trustee DeSerpa? When we saw these the other night, I felt like they were really focused on adults. Did, were any changes made to really help refocus on our students? No, uh, but we will have this one more revision, which will include the comments from the board that you'd like to see. So we have that written down as a next step for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else? Um, and Dr. Contreras, you can still take feedback from board members. They can reach out to you individually and give you their individual feedback that you can take into consideration. We had one board member that also had to leave this evening ill, so just want to make sure we're affording that opportunity before this comes back at our next meeting in November. And, um, and Trustee Doug I don't know what you mean, because you know she's going to retire from here in like 40 years, but I just wanted to correct you on that. Oh. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so, anything else? No? All right. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. We are going to move on to item 12.3, an update on completed Measure L bond projects. This report will be presented by our Director of M&O and Facilities, Mr. Hernando Fernandez, and his assistant director of MO facilities, Mr. Sergio Reese. Welcome. Good evening, President Acosta, Superintendent Dr. Contreras, board members. My name is Elena Fernandez. I'm the director of maintenance and operations. First of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Navarro to your new position here at the board. Thank you for taking the time and joining the board. I'm gonna give a major, major L bun update. Our vision. Our vision here at Barra Valley Unified School District, our vision is very student, that every student will graduate ready to share their unique skills and abilities and be a positive contributing member of their community and their world. Our mission, mission statement, we are committed to cultivating a nurturing environment where every student thrives academically, socially, and emotionally, empowering them to version in their dynamic and evolving world. District goals that align with them. Maintaining a balanced budget while effective, effectively ma maximizing all resources to fulfill education priorities. District 5 goal. 
ensure that all schools provide a safe and healthy positive school environment for students and staff. Here is a members of the facilities team. Erlindo Fernandez, Director of Maintenance and Operations and Facilities. Sergio Ambriz, Assistant Director of Maintenance and Operations and Facilities. Salo Tirado, Supervisor of Maintenance. Agustina Costa, Senior Planning Specialist. Angel Avila, Planning Specialist. Pedro Magaña, Planning Specialist. Terry Davis, Administrative Secretary 2 and Olga Castro, staff accountant. So our overview, the presentation will provide updates on compared measure L projects from 23-24 as well as 24-25 projects in the works. So audits and compliance. The 2022-2023 measure L financial and performance audits were presented to the board in August 2024. There were zero findings, and the audits showed the district complied in all matters. The independent auditors are working on the 2023-2024 financial and performance audits. So, measure all bond projects. So, for 23-24, so construction and site improvement projects. So, Cesar Chavez, we have site improvements, hillside erosion remediation, asphalt repairs, concrete and ADA compliance, um, access upgrades, improvement ramps, and shade structures. So the budget for that was 244296 and it's ongoing to phase two, which we are working at the moment, and it's, it's going to be $1.2 million. Clementech phase two energy projects, it's $1,295,000. 736 for school sites, and that's the portions for the schools. Linska flooring, site improvement, 18,572. New, new school flooring, 45,751. Renaissance staff, staff room, modernization, 133,196. Rolling hills, gym bleachers, modernizations, that's 27,131. And the project was from 22 and it finished in 2023. So Starlight, we have our shade structure, 57,566. And then we also had our security fencing. Aptos Junior High, our fencing was 48,410. Alianza, the fencing was 5,450. Cesar Chavez, fencing, 90,373. Watson was Charter School of the Arts, fencing, 45,600 and Watson High fencing 21,482. So with this measure L bond we also did some technology upgrades, intelligent classrooms, network equipment data drops that were added to sites, backup storage, VoIP system at all sites, security camera and systems throughout the school district, technology endowment, which we, you know, involved uh, getting cases for the devices, replacing parts and student devices and repairs. This is uh, Cesar Chavez site improvements. The hillside was repaired back in 2023, and that cost 244,296. This is ongoing project in 2024-25, estimated at 1.2 million dollars. I'm going to take phase, phase two energy projects. Exterior and interior control building lights, LED lighting, occupancy sensors, as well as um, Pelican 
thermostats, programmable thermostats for all some of the sites. New solar at Calabasas. That phase was a million two hundred ninety-five seven hundred and thirty-six. So list Linscott um, charter. So we did flooring and site improvement. You can see the before and after picture. So this portable had a lot of moisture issues. We replaced the roof, we replaced all everything on the exterior siding, and then we did all the pin board in the inside as well with all the shearing walls and the floors. So this is Renaissance, this is a staff room conversation. You can see the before and after, and you can see the big improvement on this one. We did all everything from all the shearing walls, everything that was with the floorings, upgrades in the in the two rooms, in the back section, and then we did um, a filling station. So 24, 25 projects. So as we see here, so for uh, this are this is what's left on Mesh Rail. So MSD has 33,134. Lakeview has 20,740. Linscott has 73,605. Mar Vista has 95,395. New School has 73,177. Aloni has 148,368. And Renaissance has 65,281. And in total is 517 with 702. And it's less than 1% of the bond, right? And we have to think there's you know, the, the big factor in this as well is the big flood that we had in Pajaro, right? We had a huge flood, and that project itself was $11 million. So then here we could see um, after Junior High, we're doing HMAC uh, project. Bradley is 88 walkways and marquee. Cesar Chavez is HVAC and asphalt. Landmark is playground project. PV High School is student walkway projects. Rolling Hills field project with city of Watsonville. Radcliffe is entryway and stair projects. Watsonville High School, bleacher project. And Watsonville uh, Charter School of the Arts is field repairs. I will open it up for any questions, comments. Uh, yes, so on the one thing that kind of has disappointed me with this, well, first off, I want to say MNO does a great job. But um, when these projects came, like you, you saw the staff room, I believe we also used uh, Measure L funds to paint the school. Both those two things, I would say, were not things that I heard any student ever say to me that they wanted. And um, the process around which this was decided in both cases. It was a newer teacher, or it was a newer principal coming from a comp high, and I, I, I'm, I, I kind of just don't think that there's a good understanding of all TED and the, and the needs. Um, but basically, we didn't really um, involve the community enough when it came time to choose this. Um, like, I get it, maybe it does look nicer technically, but for, for me, I don't really see that there was a lot of added value with that staff room. Um, we, there was already a staff room there anyway. The added value is maybe that there was an extra drinking fountain. I'll give you that, but it's kind of only for the staff and I'd rather have it for the students. Um, the other thing was that kind of concerns me is now that, that old staff room had multiple exits. So if we were ever to have some terrible tragedy, I would have felt safer on the old one because it had multiple exits and the current one doesn't. I think where it would have been better is getting back to the student leadership survey and they had said, Things like, like a field, like the auto shop, like the Spanish room. You talked about making kids want to come to school. Auto shop is a huge thing. And also think about the kids you're serving. These are kids who are at, the, at that school a lot of times because they don't want to go to the school in the first place. 
So if you had something like Fields, like Auto Shop, that's something that actually is going to get kids to want to come. Also, just a question I know last year for the Watsonville High Field, um, at the same meeting, there was money approved for the stairs. I'm wondering uh, what's up with that stairs right here on the other side of this. Also, I hope Measure M passes. Um, I know the public maybe has concerns with leadership. I would say it's totally legit to maybe vote to change leaders and still vote for Measure M. I, I hope the community will uh, still vote for Measure M. Thank you. Thank you. I would now bring it back to the board for uh, questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board on this item? Trustee Dodge Jr. Oh. A, couple word, a couple words to say, but I, I'd just like to start off by saying thank you, Sergio and Fernando, for the core work that's happening for the stadium and for the bleachers, because the district told us for two years it was going to be completed, and now, for anybody that has any doubts, you can go and see it. it's being completed as of right now. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my, my predecessor, the legendary coach, teacher, and community leader, Willie Hero, who helped pass Measure L. Because of him, he set the path for us to have the new portables at Mini White, the new science wing at Ian Hall, and the new turf fields that hopefully will one day will be named after him. It is because of him and because of Measure L, currently you could go to the cafeteria to see which is upgraded and up to date. If you go to the library, which is upgraded as well. And because of Measure M and him, the new basketball court, the, the, which is you know, the basketball and other team, the volleyball team, which recently won. Um, these are great accomplishments because of my predecessor, Measure L, and these are the results. You know, people that might have doubts, please come and look. Go to these fields, go to these classrooms. Uh, things are being done. Uh, you know, finally, I, I kind of find it disheartening and, and disrespectful that, you know, we have some teachers here at Watsonville High, one of them left earlier. Um, for two years, he emailed me asking Danny, you know, we need help with air conditioning. You know, it gets hot, you know, in certain portables. You know, I know it gets hot upstairs because I also attended this school. And I graduated in 2000. And because of certain differences, when we asked for his help to, to help us with his new bond, he said no. And so hopefully the community understands, you know, we might have differences, we might agree or disagree on certain issues, but all of us here, you know, my colleagues who were here before me who helped pass Measure N, you know, the way they've always supported infrastructure and it's quite disheartening when we, when we let certain issues get in the way when these colleagues of, of mine who all support the new bond and whether you know, all the time in the work, they helped with the older one. They, they understand infrastructure, and I would like to thank, you know, the trustee, the, the SERPA, and, and trustee Acosta for bringing this measure out to make these things happen in, in my trustee area. And hopefully, you know, we can support the next one because things are getting done. The results are here in my trustee area. And so I would just like to thank you guys. Thank this board for, you know, pushing this next bond. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. I'll, I'll just clarify, just for the record, I wasn't on the board when Measure L was approved by the board, but I think Trustee DeSerpa might have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Trustee Bolano Scow. Yes, yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, also, there's a great slide on the other part of your presentation, the total Measure L. Yeah. I wonder if we might put on the screen. It's a really great slide. Uh, it's on the agenda packet for anybody following at home because people ask, did my school get its fair share? Did my school get its fair share? And actually, this slide shows the share. It's, at least it's in my agenda. It's a beautiful, it's a great slide. What slide number? It's, uh, it's in the, it's in a different PowerPoint. It's in the, yeah. It, it does like you refer to is on the board docs for anybody who wants to go in there and look at it. It's, it's got a list of all the projects that we're done with major L. Yeah, and, and the total amounts for each school, which is super helpful. One question I'm getting with regards to Measure M, and I wonder if you might 
be able to answer for L and for M. How are these, was this division predetermined or did it just come about over time, project by project, about how much every school site got? Hey, good evening. My name is Jenny M. CBO. Um, so my understanding is with Measure L, the state allocations were um, uh, based off of the state needs at that time. So there were the priority projects uh, that were determined by both um, administration, the board, and um, community input at all the sites. Um, and they were weighted um, based on the need of both security infrastructure and programmatic needs. And at the school site, at the school site council, whether it could be parent input, is that right? Yes. Okay, great. And so is that a similar process? Is that what we envision a similar process with Measure and Pass? Yes, we've already started engaging in um, Measure M school site council presentations um, and seeking community input. So um, by the end of October, we will have um, gone to majority of the school sites and we'll be continuing to finish um, through the beginning part of November. And we'll also be sending out a survey to school sites um, in the community um, through Parent Square um, soon as well. Um, what we're looking at right now um, that we'll be bringing to board should measure and pass um, is what we um, consider an equitable uh, allocation method that a lot of school districts right now throughout California are utilizing, such as San Francisco Unified. Um, what this system does is it looks at um, certain factors, such as um, uh, critical infrastructure needs, age of the building, enrollment in certain types of programs, such as CTE, um, uh, looking at community needs as well, uh, student demographics, and giving each of those factors a weighted um, a point system um, so that we can bring that to the community and say, this is how we assess the need at your, at your specific facility. So um, when we brought um, the presentation to put uh, Measure M on the ballot measure, we saw that throughout the district, we have certain school sites that have uh, facilities that are over 100 years old. We have many school sites that were built between 1950s and 1970s. So depending on whether a school site is newer or older, it would have a different weighted factor. Thank you for that great answer. Um, so is it, can we, is it safe to say every school site will get some funds? Yes. Yeah, we'll get that. that's important for anybody that's following. We can't say exactly how the division is going to break down at this point. Yes, uh, that would not come uh, to board until after, um, after the election. And, and would you envision that a, a recommendation on how much to spend at every school site? Yes. Oh wow, okay, mm -hmm. wow. That's, that's very, very powerful. Um, those are my main questions for right now. Thank you for, that, for that, those answers. Thank you, Trustee Palamos. Anyone else? Trustee Dr. Navarro. Thank you. I, I believe I met you at the school and site council for Aptos High School. Um, one issue that I would have is there was me and maybe one other parent at that meeting. Um, so how, other than at those school and site councils, how, as the district, can we involve parents more in the decision of where the money was spent? And I think that's something that we um, will definitely need a lot of support from both um, you know, board, um, school site administrators, and really our school site councils, um, parent leaders, um, and school community. We've been um, uh, doing our best to really drum up so, uh, um, support around um, getting as many parents to the presentations as possible. I know that I know all our principals have been doing a lot of work of getting the word out there. We've been um, sharing um, uh, notices about when the presentations are being held through Parent Square. Um, it's also on our website. Um, principals have been sharing that out through um, through their messaging. Um, and then also through social media. Just like with the kids, parents respond to reinforcement as well. And maybe if they were clearing some of those tardies that they get going up the driveway, they might be more inclined to show up. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Navarro. Trustee DeSoto, did you have anything? Yeah, I think so. so I know that we needed um, more, probably a billion dollars in repairs uh, to our district facilities. 
and so we're going out for 315, which um, is a lot uh, for the taxpayers. I understood, but I'm not sure it's been made very um, transparent that we do have a bond um, amount on people's property taxes that will be sunsetting soon. Do we, can you tell me when that is? Yes, um, so our measure um, J will be sunsetting, I believe, in 2029. Oh, 2029, I thought it was yes. sooner than that. Uh, 2020, 2029, we can uh, find out for sure which year, but it's within a few years. Okay, so that I think is a, is a big selling point, is that there will be a, a reduction in property tax um, with that. Um, so the last time that we went out for a bond, we had a um, consultant walk every facility with um, m and and the principal and the lead custodian to determine what the needs were on, of, of the facility. And I know we, had, we did that too, which is largely what makes up the list that's being sent to the public. Um, they're very general things, and that's why I think people at, on the sites are having confusion about what exactly is it that's going to happen here because we're leaving it very general. Um, one of the mistakes that we made last time is when we went to site councils and to PTAs and home and school clubs, etc. Um, we, uh, we allowed for them to sort of prioritize what projects should be completed on the sites. And what that did was made it so that the things that we actually should have been doing, like roofs, um, and structural things um, sometimes didn't happen because we had already promised to do other projects with with the stakeholders on those sites. So I would caution a little bit about that. Like, no, we should not make promises that we do not keep because then people feel disappointed and they don't trust the district. So, um, and, so anyway. Um, you make a great point. Um, uh, going back to the specific needs at the site, so all of the presentations that we've been doing around Measure M at the school site council meetings um, list the specific say, um, uh, potential projects um, and needs based on the site walks that the Architect 196 has done with our m and team. Um, and this process started uh, prior to COVID. Um, it started back in 2018-2019. Um, where and that's where the list of the comprehensive projects come from and uh, you're absolutely right I think Measure L was um, a big learning experience for us as a district um, I feel really lucky that um, actually the um, last um, we, uh, couple of our prior CBOs um, uh, Clint Rucker and Brett McFadden have been very generous in um, sharing kind of uh, their experiences, uh, what they've learned, and their recommendations going forward um, with us. So we've been able to incorporate some of what they've learned um, into going into Metro M and planning for the potential projects. So we've been very clear at the School State Council uh, presentations for Metro M that projects will be prioritized based on not only um, critical, urgent needs um, related to things like safety, um, um, HVAC, HVAC, yes. Um, critical infrastructure, um, and then so we'll have the, the absolute needs and then we'll get community input to help prioritize more of the wants. That's great. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. Um, I had one more thing, but uh, I guess I'll leave it there because I can't remember what I was going to say. Thank you, Trustee DeServa, Trustee you. Dr. Navarro. Um, the parent view site that you all use to communicate with parents would be a really great way to show, like at the individual school levels, what we're planning on doing, and that may improve some of your support for Measure M, because as I said, I was literally one of two parents in a school of what, 1,500 kids that showed up at this meeting. So it might be a good way to get the word out. Thank you. I did remember, I'm sorry. Thank you, Trustee. Um, our trustee to serve them. Somebody, I think it was Chris Webb, said earlier something about painting buildings isn't we shouldn't be doing that, and I absolutely disagree. I think all of our schools need to look beautiful. Like, we need to be proud. We want our parents to be proud. We want our students to enjoy walking in there. And also, it just helps keep up with the upkeep of the building. So I do think that should be a top priority, grounds and um, the way the facilities look. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anything else? All right, seeing none, thank you, Ms. M, and thank you, Melinda, thank you, Sergio, for um, your presentation.
It's greatly appreciated. All right. Oops. And with that, it's very early up here. Um, I'll now move us to item 14.1. Our next regular board meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, November 13th. And I will adjourn this meeting at 9.57 p.m. in honor of uh, Trustee Dr. Navarro's first meeting with us.